call up Pastor uh, Cynthia Burns to come up. She's going to open up the song. Uh, and then we're going to just pray. Let's get the spirit going on here. And, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it down to start with our, our questions. Okay, so uh, just so we, we know who everybody is here and everybody's view, I just want to um, introduce everybody. So the first person, the lovely lady all the way to my left, is Pastor Mary Rose McAvoy and her... And she's coming with our roundtable today, which is on Are We in the End Times? Uh, it's an eschatology discussion. She is coming from the premillennialist view. So, uh, uh, and, and the gentleman right next to her is Pastor Mike Burns. And Pastor Mike Burns is coming from the dispensationalist viewpoint. And uh, my gentleman right in front of me over here from, from Fort Myers, Florida is Pastor Mike Miano. And Pastor Mike Nano is coming from the full preterist viewpoint. And the gentleman all the way to my right is Apostle Ronald Price. And he's coming from the viewpoint of fulfilled covenant eschatology. Amen. Amen. So can I have Pastor uh, Cynthia Burns to come up? Please be right here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, this is a good day. Yes. You know, one of the things I wanted all of us to remember is the important thing that Jesus is Lord. Amen. He's our master and our savior and our redeemer and our God and our leader. And we're following him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's just worship him before we get into this. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Bring that. Redeemer, Savior of the world, wonderful counselor, bright morning star.
our church. Hallelujah. Let's push that right now. Hallelujah. Jesus, we worship you right now, Father God. Glory to your name, Father God. Hallelujah, Father God. I praise your name today, Father God. I glorify your name today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. Father God, I thank you for the spirit of unity, Father God, in the house tonight, Lord God. Father God, that a heart and soul, Father God, would just be completely yours today, Father. I pray, Lord God, that you would plow the hearts, Father God, and put a spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in the house today, Father God. Father God, praise your name, Father. Lord, we glorify your name. Lord, you are worthy to be praised, Father. Jesus, hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised, Father. Hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised, Father. Glory to your name, Father God. You are worthy, Father God. Hallelujah, Father. You are worthy to be praised, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Father Lord. Pray, Spirit, peace in this house today, Father. And I want to thank you for bringing every single one of the, the pastors and leaders here, Father God, for this discussion for the body of Christ, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, Father God. I ask you to bless them and bless their families, Father God. For the works that they are doing for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Father. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, can we make some noise for God? Can we clap our hands for God? Just keep them in prayer, and if anybody uh, does not have a place where they can tie in to help, 
um, feed these people, clothe these people. Uh, they're still in desperate need of D batteries and, and some coats and blankets and stuff like that. So we're doing the best we can uh, to, to, to be a light to these people, to reach out uh, to these people. Uh, because they, this is the time where the body of Christ can really be God's arms extended and, and really lift them up and build these people back up. And um, we're just praying that God does a, a, a wonderful thing with that and, and that, that, that we can be used as a testimony in this time for these people who are in need. So, all right, we can uh, put the lights back up because I'm sure people are going to be reading stuff. Um, so we introduced the members of, the, of our panel today. And uh, just so everybody here knows, I don't know if anybody knows exactly uh, what all their stances are, but they are very widely um, and very far apart. Uh, but it's a good thing because, see, iron sharpens iron. And, you know, some people take that iron sharpening iron as, you know, a bowl of night with your church. You know, and although that's good, but that's not iron sharpening iron, okay? We got if you ever watch iron sharpen iron, you are taking two pieces of iron and smashing them against each other. You know, and it's good to be challenged in your belief and challenged in your faith because a faith that can't be challenged is a faith that cannot be trusted. So I, I pray that uh, this is going to be, uh, again, an awesome day today. So, um, and you know, we've got the, some of the most amazing people up front here, too, who are going to do this with nothing but respect for each other. Uh, just like Pastor Bill just said to me five minutes ago, we are Christians first uh, before we do anything and, and start fighting theology. Um, so, and, and that's number one. But we're going to put our viewpoints forward here, and uh, I'm going to be timing all this stuff. So when you see me on my phone, I'm not texting my wife in the background. Um, I will be, uh, I have a stopwatch, and um, just so you guys know the panel, when I, when I knock on my thing, you got 20 seconds left, okay? So, uh, just to give you the, the heads up on that. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a five-minute opening statement. They're going to introduce themselves and what they believe and, and position themselves, and they each got five minutes to do so. Uh, if you finish before the five minutes, you can just, you know, tell me you're done and we can move on. But you got the, the full range of, of five minutes. Uh, there is a, an order that I laid out for them. And then what we got is we got... Um, three questions. We're going to have question one, which is why do you think we are not, we are or are not in the end times? The second question is uh, Matthew 24, 3 states, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Explain why you think this verse has been fulfilled or is still yet to come and the significance of it. Then after that, we're going to do a five-minute cross-examination where each member of the panel will be able to ask questions to the other members of the panel. And then we got the third question is, what does this doctrine of the end times matter to us Christians every day? What are the advantages and disadvantages of it? And then we're going to open up for the last 20 minutes for you guys. If you guys have any questions for any of these people, that you can ask questions. And, and uh, I'm, I know all these people will be more than happy to answer them. So are we good to go? All right, can we clap again? Can we do that? We do a lot of okay, so we're going to start with uh, Pastor McAvoy, and she's going to begin right now. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Mary Rose McAvoy, and it's nice to present the pre millennial view of eschatology. And eschatology just means last, the study of last things. And uh, I just wanted to read um, the Apostle Paul's prayer to the Ephesian church first. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Amen. We are children of the light, and we have an enlightened revelation of what our future holds. Amen. And uh, the teaching, of, the traditional teaching of the pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, view of eschatology, uh, believes in definitely a literal return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Uh, we'll start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be, ever be with the Lord. 
comfort one another. And um, just the, 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 the scriptural evidence for the literal return of Jesus Christ to the earth uh, in Acts chapter 1, uh, when Jesus ascended to heaven, the two angels said, Why do you stand here gazing up into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So there's the, the angels telling them that you will see the Lord's return. Literally. And the, um, the, the, the prophet said that his foot is going to touch the mound of olives and split. So hit, there you have the Old Testament prophecy saying the Lord himself shall return. Jesus will return. His first ad advent was the incarnation of the Son of God. And it was a unique invasion of eternity into time. And that's how um, we come to the conclusion of what is called progressive eschatology, which is a process of realization, an eschatology that is both present and future. It began with the words and works of Christ, and uh, it was fulfilled in the words and works of Jesus, who would one day come again as a conquering king. The powers of the age to come have invaded this present age, but only in part. Our future redemption awaits us. There is a present reality of the kingdom of God, because we have the spirit, the spirit living in us. And there is a future promise, consummated when the Son of Man returns in power. So, we are not yet completed in the work that he began in us. Uh, who he predestinated, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, then he, he also glorified, which is a continuation of the work that he began. Are any of you here glorified yet? The answer is no. You're not in your glorified body yet. You still have the earth suit. You still have the flesh. All of us will taste death. So we are not glorified yet. That awaits us. It is a future promise to come. We are not ignorant. We know that the purpose of the Son of God manifest was to destroy the works of the devil. We are in this church age, this present age, that's still under the control of Satan. Yes, we've invaded it because we have now the gospel, the preaching of the kingdom. But it has not yet been completed. It began with the works and works of Jesus. He passed it on to the disciples and the disciples to the church. We are presently in the church age, which is the calling out of the Jews and Gentiles from all nations, all peoples, building up the body of Christ. Israel set aside temporarily. The church is also the bride of Christ to provide by the seven churches of Revelation. And so... Hey, <laughs> These five minutes go fast. <laughs> Okay, next up we got Pastor Mike Miata, and you can go now. Good morning. I am Pastor Mike Miano. I am director of the Freaked Out Movement, as well as the Fellowship Church in Fort Myers, Florida, and I am here to represent Full Preterism. Now let me just break down Full Preterism for you. The word full means, well, full, completed. And preterism comes from the Latin term praetor, meaning past. So full preterism would mean that I believe all biblical prophecy has been fulfilled in the past. More specifically, in that generation, by A.D. 70, at the destruction of the temple. I would say that when one stone was left, not left upon another, that that was the fulfillment of the end of the age. So the biggest issue we have is paradox. You know, we do, not folk, we do not come to the scriptures with an empty mind. We come with things we've learned from sermons, books, things we've heard, tradition. And we allow that to form our opinion. And sometimes we don't realize that we're coming with a paradigm. And that leaves us without excuse to continually reform our thoughts, our paradigm, with the word of God. If we believe the scriptures are for doctrine, then we need to allow the scriptures to give us the answer. So... 
N.T. Wright, a uh, popular scholar and author, he has recently noted that in the 20th century, we have one advantage over our predecessors, and that's we're starting to realize that we need to see Jesus in his Jewish context. And with that, the one thing we have to understand is audience relevance, is the principle that what did this, when I speak to you, what does it mean to you? And then what will it mean to the person after you? Obviously, it will mean something to you primarily. And then whatever it means to the next person, that's secondary. So you have to go by what the primary, the audience relevance to me speaking to you would be the, my message. And then whatever that comes after that, that is second hand. That's not primary audience relevance to the original audience. When we look at Jewish understanding, the first thing we have to understand is Hebrew idioms, metaphors, hyperbole that we see all throughout the scripture. You see a uh, coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, new heavens, new earth. The term heavens and earth is a Hebrew idiom. It's used all throughout scripture. So we can do this best by comparing scriptures with scriptures and understanding what this means in one spot, and then I can bring that over to another spot and understand that better. That's how we can understand how it meant to the original audience. The next thing is, for preterists, we don't avoid time statements. We let soon mean soon, near means near, at hand means at hand, and uh, you know, it doesn't mean 2,000 years later. So, a prime example of this would be Daniel 12. Daniel 12, uh, the Apostle Daniel was told to seal up the prophecy because the time was not yet. Then, in Revelation, John, he's told to not seal up the prophecy because the time is soon. The time is at hand. So from Daniel to John, it's about 500 years. From John till today would be 2,000. That creates a problem. 2,000 is not soon. So one of the things I heard recently was that any text without context is a comma. And, you know, I think that it is time, I believe it is time that we stop reading the newspaper and then reading our Bibles, we start reading our Bibles first and allow the newspapers to be secondary. And that's how we can create our worldview. So, I believe that we have to contend with what this meant to the original audience that Jesus was speaking to. How they would have understood Jesus' words. It's high time that we let the confusion of the end times be removed by realizing we're living in the fulfillment of Israel's prophecies. We're living in, God fulfilled His promises, He glorified Israel. And we're living in that reality. There's no need to add an extra hope to the biblical hope of Israel. One of Preterism's most significant conclusions is that we are in the kingdom of God. That those of us, spiritually, it's in our heart, it's an unseen kingdom, and we who are in Christ can see Christ's face. This is and was the spiritual hope of Israel. Okay, next up we got Pastor Mike Burns. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hold on, see right? Oh, there we go. Okay, you can start now. You have a new YouTube. By the way, I don't even know why I'm here. I was just driving down the road and uh, somebody caught me off and I pulled into this park and I walked into the chat and someone said, come sit down here in front of this microphone. So, <laughs> I'm trying to get a little levity here. This is getting a little uh, technical here. So let's have some fun today. Can we have some fun? Amen. I'm taking the dispensationalist point of view. I want to just say to you, I've been a pastor now on this island for 20, I'm in my 28th year. Um, my wife and I have been married 27 years. And uh, we've been laboring on this island for a long time. We're graduates of uh, Brother Hagen, School of Kenneth Hagen, uh, Raymond Bible Training Center down in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I don't know if you knew this in Broken Arrow. They don't have a, in Oklahoma, they don't have a Broken Arrow. They also have a Broken Boat Town down there as well. And they said that's why the Indians lost Oklahoma, because they broke their arrow and they broke their bow. I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, anyway, I uh, want to just uh, say first of all, uh, Apostle Johnny, that I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me and my wife. And I neglected to greet your beautiful bride back over there, Rachel. Rachel, thank you for having us as well. And I didn't get a chance to see that beautiful baby, but I'm hoping to before we leave here today. And you may be wondering why I'm doing all these preliminary remarks, because I don't really have a whole lot to say. <laughs> Yeah, just kidding. Oh, forgive me. Uh, I've been through a lot of the last couple of days. My dad almost died yesterday. And uh, thank God uh, you all joined us in prayer. And he's doing well now. And uh, so I've had a lot of distractions these last few days. But I believe what the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3. It says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners, speaking times past by the prophets, 
has spoken unto us in his last days through his son. Now when you break that verse down, it says, God who had sons three times, that means at different times, and in diverse manners, meaning in different kinds of ways, spoke unto the fathers through the prophets. So God had different time periods where he was speaking to people through different ways. But the Bible said he hath in these last days spoken unto us through his son, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in a, you know, in a, in a systematic type of theology. I believe uh, men like Arthur Payne, what they've written, I've read their his materials, Lewis Perry Schaefer, uh, uh, some of you may have heard of the Ryrie Study Bible, I mean, it's Charles Ryrie, he's also a dispensationalist. You know, I would say that there's much that I agree with in dispensationalism, and there are probably some things about it that I don't agree with. You know, I really think that there's probably on this panel here things that Mary Rose is going to say, Pastor Mike's going to say, Bishop's going to say, and there'll be pieces of it that we're all going to agree with, but there may be some pieces we don't agree with. You know, Scott Wesley Brown wrote a song many years ago, he said, no one of us has got it all together. But all of us together got it all. <laughs> and I kind of believe like that. That uh, no, no, I'm not saying that about like the whole witnesses don't have it, the Mormons don't have it. I'm talking about those of us in the body of Christ. But I think we've got to be aware of something uh, the scripture teaches us. Uh, it talks about in the last days there will be seducing spirits and doctrines that are taught by demons. And I think the scripture tells us that uh, Paul said to Timothy to study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, listen to this now, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, if the word can be rightly divided, how many of you understand it can also be wrongly divided? Now, there are some things that we cannot risk wrongly dividing in Scripture. Those things that we wrongly divide are concerning salvation, concerning uh, the Holy Spirit, concerning prayer, can really mess people's lives up. The things about eschatology, though, in my opinion, they, you know, there's, there's a little broadness about that topic, and, uh, and we ought to, you know, see what we see and say what we say, and be open to have the Lord perhaps even correct us on some of our, our thinking in that area. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to talk about dispensations. I'm going to talk about that I believe, I don't believe in replacement theology, and that means simply that uh, we're replacing Israel with the church. I think uh, that God said something to Abraham back in Genesis 15 that's very, very uh, powerful. He told him to go forth and uh, he said, look up in the sky and he says, count the stars if you can for number. Uh, and then he said, look at the sand on the seashore. If you can count the, the grains of sand on the seashore, so shall your seed be. And we know that that seed that came from Abraham wasn't just Isaac, not just Jacob, but was ultimately Israel. And I believe that he was telling them that there were two, two kinds of Israels. There was the natural Israel, the sand on the seashore, and the stars of the sky representing the spiritual Israel, which is the church. And we'll pick up from there in a moment. Wow, you are on time. I mean, it's five minutes on the dot, like the zero, 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 zero. Thank you very much. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, people. <laughs> all right, Apostle Price. Oh, all right. Um, where should we start at? Well, I've been out in um, Hempstead. It will be eight years soon. But um, I was raised in a, a traditional Pentecostal, spirit-filled type environment with a strong dispensational type of teaching and thinking. And my first adult pastor, uh, when I was about 21, was strong. He was a Schofieldian. He just loved Schofield. And that was constantly given to us, but at the same time, we were also strong on covenantal theology because he was a big uh, follower of um, um, Kenneth Connor, uh, Ken Connor. And so in my own studies, what I begin to look at, I begin to realize that the canon, as we know it, is really two bookends of two stories. You start in a garden, you get in a garden. You start in a garden with covenant being issued, not directly being said, but Adam, if you do, thus and thus, then this and that. That's covenant, covenantal conditions. Well, we see two trees there, but yet when we come to the book of Revelations, we see only one tree. We see the tree of life there, tree of life there, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is gone. And so now that begins to say to me that there's something significant about these covenants. And then you have two major covenants, as we know most of us. You have the covenant of the law, or sometimes you hear the old covenant. And then you have the covenant of grace, or you hear the New Testament covenant. But yet there were many covenants within that. And they were within various time frames 
And so I do believe God does speak in different time frames, revealing things, but it's all based upon one ultimate continual purpose. And you see Adam is even mentioned, I believe if I'm correct, in the genealogy in the book of Luke, he, he comes all the way down backwards and says, Adam, the son of God. Then we realize that there is a last Adam, which is Christ, the son of God. So I begin to see in my studies that there, there was an intention. There was a covenant made with a son and fulfilled with the son. And then he's the firstborn of many brethren. So that began to force me to look through everything through the eyes of the one that says it is finished. Now contextually when he was saying it is finished, he was dealing with his time on the cross, his time in the role as the lamb. But there are things that I see in the scripture that have perpetual, continual unfolding. I believe that the scriptures are fulfilled, but yet I do not believe because they're fulfilled that they don't have relevance that continues throughout various cycles of time. You know, and so, and then I believe that those things are yet being revealed to us. I like when I heard, you know, Pastor Mike said we all have a different piece, different part, and I believe that wholeheartedly, and I also believe that the controversies that we're facing now are of the Spirit of God. The reason I believe that now, all experiences can be subjective, but I've had a consistent, when I've heard the voice of the Lord, it has been consistently it comes to pass. I remember in January 2009, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and began to say, these are the days of the greater light. My response was, well, what are you saying? And the Lord began to say, go to Genesis 1.16. And I began to go and it says, and the greater light shall rule the day, the lesser light the night. And then the Spirit of the Lord said, so what did Paul teach? Well, we're no longer children of the night, but of the day. That began to open up something to me because in covenantal theology, we realize that the true Son is the Son of God. And that moon is a reflection of the Son, which would be sort of like the ecclesia of the church. Well, the Lord began to say to me that the church has lived in lesser light. I said, what are you saying? He said, there's days of great controversy and challenge ahead that's going to challenge everything you call doctrine. And so I begin to watch the controversies begin to happen and people have lost friendships, relationships, which is crazy to me, over this subject. This is necessary because even as what was mentioned, which I know we're going to get into from out of Hebrews 1 and 3, you know, God has sundry times has spoken to the fathers and the prophets and in these last days, if I was standing there and I heard that, my ears would say, this is the last days in which that statement was made. And so out of that, in those time elements, because I'm a strong believer in context, in time context and historical context, I don't believe that we can ignore the historical context around which statements were made, which is why I believe in fulfillment. I believe that it was more about fulfilling of covenant than necessary saying fulfilling that such and such is going to happen. All right, let's give our panel a round of applause for that. Okay, we're going to turn it back to, to Pastor McAvoy, and, and she's going to begin on question number one. Why do you think we are or are not in the end times? Please use scriptural references in your answer. And again, they got five minutes apiece. Pastor, you may go. Called uh, birth pains. Beginning. You can see the beginning, it would be as birth pains. And we know birth pains increase in frequency, intensity, closer as we get to the Lord's return. And his, uh, I just want to read the scripture. Realize uh, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant. Violence, disobedient parents, ungrateful, irreconcilable, malicious, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, re reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4, which it describes in the last days. And we, we see just the, the, uh, the lack of reverence uh, for, the, for the things of God. One of the signs is uh, calling uh, good evil and evil good. That can be found in 2 Timothy 3 and 3. And uh, ju just in, in this past year, we had our president affirm, using his faith, his Christian faith, to affirm 
homosexuality, which is clearly condemned by scripture. We have never had a president in American history ever proclaim that over our nation, an abomination. And it will take effect through federal uh, legislation, which will affect all of our lives, just not state by state. So here we have a shift in good and evil. How do we know we're in the last days? Because it's increasing. Because 50 years ago, society could agree what good and evil was. We have uh, laws that are still on the books for sodomy because society could agree 50 years ago that homosexuality was a sin. So now we have compromising churches, we have people who are in office railroading us. We have our own governor and own mayor who railroaded the, the residents of New York State and pushed gay marriage for our state without giving us a vote, which in most states, the vote it would not pass. But in this last election, it passed in a few more states. So just see the progression. Just see the progression. How uh, we are, at one time, society could say, that this was wrong, this was a sin. But now, we have a compromised society. And we have a compromising church that uh, does not pre uh, present scripture and right and wrong in the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error. So just the increasing of, of wickedness, just um, just the lack of reverence, there's an uh, increase in uh, anti-Christ, uh, the war of Christmas, but I, when I was growing up, they, they didn't say take down the manger, take down this. Uh, I'm going to a board meeting next week because they're calling it a holiday party, but we could all uh, say that it was a Christmas party when I was growing up. It's just, it's just an antagonism, um, irreverence, uh, it, it, it's a lack of a society accepting that we are a Christian nation, so there's there's definitely been a shift. So let let it be known that there's a, a shift in and, and signs in nature that are changing. We're ha if you if you look at the graph of hurricanes and disasters, we just had our own disaster. It's increasing. It's increasing, and uh, it's always been prophesied that Manhattan would be. I always heard water water around Manhattan, and then we had tunnels. The Midtown Tunnel was filled with water. And I believe that this is just giving us a taste of the times that we are about to experience. Maybe we're, we're being prepared for a coming economic and energy crisis. What are we going to do? Do you know how many, how many people that is affected? We couldn't buy gas. And, and this was just a disaster that affected our, our, south, our south shore, New Jersey. You know, what happens if, if, if we had something economically happen where it just collapsed? Or some are predicting in two years. We'll be bankrupt. There's no more money. Are we prepared? What, what are we going to do as a society? We have to understand the progression. Yeah, you got 20 seconds. Okay. Right. Thank you. 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 I do not believe we are in the end times. I, the end times of the end of the age that was prophesied to Israel. I do believe we are in an end times, or a last days, so to speak, of a futuristic teaching that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. As noted by N.T. Wright, that we have one advantage over our predecessors, that we can now realize that we have to read Jesus in his Jewish context. We, in the information age that we are in right now, we are able to learn more about history than any other time before. I can pull out my phone. We have men sitting up here, men and women sitting up here with computers, and we can find out so much more information about the past than ever before. So I think it's important to consider yesterday. You know, a lot of times everybody wants to say, after tomorrow, you know, the end times, after tomorrow, look into the future and figure out the times we're in. I think we need to consider yesterday. I don't believe we should be unaware of what's going on in our society today and that we can definitely learn from the past. As I read, I want to pay attention to pronouns. I'm going to ask you to do so as well. Pay attention to who's being spoken to and what is it being said in these verses. In Acts chapter 2, verse 16, Peter addresses the whole crowd of fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem. And he says, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. 
in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, to the Corinthian church in 60-something A.D., the Apostle Paul writes, These things happened to them, the Old Testament saints, as examples and were written down as warnings to us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, which was written in 67 to 70 A.D., it says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers, the forefathers of Israel, through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us through his Son. Hebrews 9, 26 says, Jesus appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin as a sacrifice of himself. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, John writing to the seven churches of the province of Asia, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And in verse 3, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written, because the time is near. Revelation 22, verse 10. Then he told me, do not seal up the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. These were the last days that the prophets had warned Israel about. A new covenant that was about to cause the rising and falling of many in Jerusalem, as we read in Luke chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it says, What is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. In AD 70, the temple was destroyed. It was recognized that something was passing away. Even the historian Josephus says that we have recognized that Ari. And this seems to me have been the reason why God, out of his hatred to these men's wickedness, rejected our city. And as for the temple, he no longer esteemed it sufficiently pure for him to inhabit therein. But brought the Romans upon us, and threw a fire upon the city to purge it, and brought upon us, our wives, our children, slavery, as desirous to make us wiser by our calamities. I cannot stress enough how important it is to understand the transition that is going on within the New Testament. What was going and what was coming? What were these last days that Israel was experiencing at that time? David Shilton notes the biblical expression of the last days properly refers to the birth and ministry of Christ until the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, the last days of Israel during the transition period from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. This was an end of a system of death that kept Israel in bondage to sin. Where there was law, there was sin. They were in bondage to this sin as long as this temple that demonstrated their law, the power of the holy people that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 12. When this temple was destroyed, it would be the end of the age. This is what the apostles who understood the prophets of the Old Testament were speaking about when they referred to the end of time, or the time of the end as it is biblical. This was when a judgment would occur, a resurrection and a new heaven and a new earth. This would be fulfilled so that in the coming ages, he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This was the age to come where there would be eternal life. Simply put, we are not experiencing the last days. They ended in AD 7. Okay, next up, Pastor Mike Burns. And you can start now. You guys still doing good, are you? Yep. I want to uh, draw your attention to something in Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> it says here, and I believe we're living in the last days. Uh, it says here in verse number 6, Jesus had now appeared uh, after his resurrection to his disciples. And they were gathered together. It says here in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Obviously, at this time, that hadn't happened. That's why they were asking the question. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Very interesting set of words here. Which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the most part of the earth. Well, it's interesting because there are times dispensations, and seasons. Daniel, I believe it's in Daniel 7, and I think it's verse 24 and or 25. You can look it up. But it says, and it's talking about that Antichrist. Now, I know that there's two Antichrists. There's the actual Antichrist. I think mean, that is a person. But there's also a spirit of Antichrist that the Bible said that's already now in the world. And it says when he comes, he's going to try to wear out the saints, number one. 
But he's also going to try to do two other things. He's going to try to change times and laws, is what he's going to try to do. Why is he going to do that? Well, the reason that Satan, who's really behind Antichrist, is because he wants to prolong his time on the earth. Revelation tells us he knows his time is short. So he's trying to extend his time. Why? So that he can uh, corrupt people to the point where they turn from God, don't turn to Christ, and he can have them for eternity in a godless lake of fire. Can someone say amen to that? All right. So now I want you to go with me in your, in your Bible, if you would, here to uh, 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. Let me go over there myself. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And I want to start in verse 1. It says, This know also, and I love this expression, that in the last days, notice this, perilous times shall come. Now I want to just stop right there, and I want to take you back in your thoughts to what Peter said, that Pastor Mike just quoted there from Acts, where Peter said, You know, it shall come to pass, quoting Joel, Joel chapter 2, and it shall come to pass, in the last days, God said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, someone one time asked the question, if that was the last days, and that was 2,000 plus years ago, how can it be the last days still today? It's 2,000 years. Well, you have to understand, that was the beginning of the last days, and we're living in the end of the last days. That's what I believe. I believe saints that day, 1,000 AD, we're living in the middle of the last days. Because the last days is actually a time period. That's what a dispensation means. An age means a time period. And, you know, Scripture tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8, Peter said, the day of the Lord is going to be coming. And he said, it's going to be like a thousand years as a day, and a day is a thousand years. Now, I don't believe that that's necessarily meaning that in God's, you know, time clock, that that's an actual, you can lay it over everything, a thousand years for one day in heaven. But I do think it's explaining that a time period or a day in God's mind is broader than a day in our mind. We think it was a 24-hour period. God's saying it's much broader and much bigger than that. So that we are living, I believe, in the end of the last days. And this is the description I think uh, Pastor Mary Rose was trying to bring, uh, the thought she was eloquently bringing out. It says, this know also that in the last days, that's that time period, perilous times shall come. So that within this dispensation of the last days, there are going to be slivers of time that are going to be expressed this way. Verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do we see that happening today? People will be covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Listen to this, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, we are to turn away. So the scripture clearly describes the time that we're living in. That it is a time of perilous times, dangerous. One translation brings it out that it's dangerous and difficult times. You know, we've seen danger, we've seen terrorism, we have seen people uh, you know, uh, going through tough times economically, job unemployment is so high. Well, this is why we're living in the last days, but there is faith for the last days. We'll talk about that a little later. Perfect. Five seconds for this time. So he's trying to get it just right again. He's trying to get those zeros. <laughs> okay, Apostle Price. Uh, why do you think we are or are not in the end times? Use scripture references and you can begin now. We are not in the last days. Not within the biblical context. The biblical context of last days, if we look at Matthew, the Olivet Discourse, uh, is tied to that. The disciples say to Jesus in Matthew, uh, Matthew 24 and 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things shall be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, they asked a particular question, and as we're going to read, Jesus answers them, and the question was preferenced, signs of your coming and of the end of the world. Now, here's why I have an issue with the King James Bible, which is a whole other discussion. That particular word there, world, is the word aeon. It should not have been translated world. Uh, the word that most closely translated world from out of Greek would be cosmos. All right? And so that should say the end of the age. End of the age. Which gives me understanding that the disciples had understanding that there were ages. Now we see that term used continually. 
And so when we say end of the world, based on our cultural thinking and constant overlaying of religious thinking, we think end of the earth. Closed out as it is as knowing. Well, Jesus is going to give them, here's an answer to your question, you guys that are asking this. Jesus answers and said to him, take heed that no man deceive you. He's speaking to them directly. He says, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now that's interesting, because we do find out later on, when you do the, the readings of Josephus, the Jewish historian, that there was a rising of individuals all over the place calling themselves the Christ. We also see, which was mentioned earlier from the epistles of John, where John speaks about the spirit of Antichrist, which is now among us. Uh, we see those references made, and we know that John, writing those epistles, is many years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. And so we see the tying just together that that aspect of that was fulfilling itself even within the days of what we know was being recorded or written scripture. And then uh, earlier, as we, we heard our brother speak from concerning the book of Acts, concerning when Peter stands up and says, this is that which was spoken of, that in the last days I shall pour my spirit upon all flesh, which would imply that those were the last days in which that was happening. Now, I do like the comparison of when you look at from the time Daniel was told to seal up the book, and then John was told to open the book. It is about four or five hundred years, just a little bit shy. And I find that interesting that how do we go from those time frames, because I do believe that there is a place for understanding time. And now last days now becomes a 2,000 plus time when we see God continually in Scripture uses pattern, procedures, and principles. That's why I believe in covenantal theology. We see continual patterns. How does that become extended? Let's look at the rest of what Jesus is saying. And it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And see that none be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now that's interesting. He says, they shall hear of wars, the rumors of wars. They asked him the question. He didn't say, you're going to hear it and others to follow you will hear it. He said, you shall hear this. We cannot remove context. Proper biblical interpretation or exegesis is that we have to always look at who's speaking, who's being spoken to, what's being said, and what is the culture and time in which it is being said. If we remove those proper tools to interpret scripture, we have continual, because I can find any article anywhere. I can find anything said by anybody. I can find anything done and say, wow, this must be the last days. But I also historically can find individuals that endorsed homosexuality, that endorsed various things, and were more likely the beast, narrow, which is another subject, we could say would be considered a type of antichrist, but there is no scripture that I found that said that there is a the antichrist. I see spirit of antichrist, I see antichrists, which gives me the understanding because I, I believe literal, but we also have to be given the figurative that that is an attitude, not so much when we think Antichrist that, you know, one is against, but the literal Greek word means in place of. So that means that there will be other Christs presented. And I see many Christs that presented, and if we are in the last days, we're in the last days of this false Jesus that's been preached. All right, that concludes our, our first question. We give our contestants our panel a round of applause here. Okay. You are my first contestant. You are a contestant, Mike. <laughs> Spin the wheel. Be ready to thinking the prizes before, right? <laughs> awesome, awesome. And before we get to our next question, you know, feel free if you guys need to use the bathroom. It's in the lobby. If you want to go grab some uh, snack or get a drink, or you're more than welcome to. We got what? No, I just want to let them know. Um, if you want to get uh, the shirts, we got plenty of stuff there. So uh, we're going to move along, and I just need Rodrigo to get me my charge. Okay, next question. Uh, question number two, and we're going to start with uh, Pastor McAvoy. Uh, am I pronouncing your name right? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm sure. All right, Matthew twenty-four three states: As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, "Tell us when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming?" and the end of the world. Explain why you think this verse has been fulfilled or is still yet to come and the significance of it for us today. Again, five minutes each and you can start now. Okay, um, 
Trump biblical texts, we understand that there are double meanings. We realize there are double meanings. Um, and there is a theological explanation for the verse that he just quoted from Jesus. Now, Jesus was referring to the judicial visitation upon Jerusalem, which was destroying the temple in the AD 70. They will see referring to the Jewish nation. Uh, Jesus' words refer to the gathering of the elect from the four winds, but it moves beyond the first century in Jerusalem to the final advent and worldwide scene. So there's, there's double meaning here. And that's not uncommon in uh, biblical texts because two events are described in the same words. Similar use of language is found in Isaiah to, to describe return from the Babylonian captivity, but it also described deliverance by the Messiah. Jesus' answer is uh, just to the destruction of the Jewish state. So he answered their question, but he was also uh, describing a futuristic event, which is yet to come. And the temple was destroyed in uh, 70 AD justly because of the sins of the Jews, mercifully ending continuing, them continuing in Judaism, mysteriously to show ancient sacrifices were abolished, the Jewish economy brought to an end, and it began the introduction of the Christian dispensation, which is known as the church age. So there's theological uh, understanding that we have to have and, and a scholarly knowledge of the biblical text. And Dr. Williams can explain this very good, he was my professor in Bible college. So we have to understand, uh, we, have, we have to uh, have uh, be enlightened children of the light to properly divide the world. And we, we can't, we just can't say goodbye to Israel because uh, their temple was destroyed in 70 AD. They were temporarily on, on, on standby until their restoration. And the end time revival is connected to Israel. It's Jew and Gentile, which is the new man, according to Ephesians 1. You cannot eliminate the nation of Israel. You cannot eliminate the Jewish people because the new man is Gentile and Jew. And we are currently in the time of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles will come in. But um, I don't know what, what you would do with Romans 9, 10, and 11. Paul goes to great lengths to explain uh, the, the, the futuristic restoration of Israel. God has not forgotten Israel. They are temporarily the branches broken off. And we are the branches. They, they are the root. And branches were broken off. You can't, you can't eliminate the root. You're not going to have a tree if there's no root. And we are the Gentiles, the other nations, that are grafted into their tree and their root. So you, you, you cannot eliminate. And there, there is... There, there is theological explanation for the biblical text. And I will enter. <laughs> okay, Pastor Miano, uh, Matthew 24, 3. Uh, do you think this verse has been fulfilled or is still yet to come and the significance of it? And you can start now. All right, as I said before that the apostles knew they were in the time of fulfillment of the prophets. They knew they were in these last days that were spoken of by the prophets. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that upon us has come the fulfillment of the ages that was prophesied by the prophets. John the Baptist, when he's preaching prior to Christ's coming, he says to the Pharisees, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says the axe is already at the root. So, Real quickly, I'm just going to go back to Matthew 23 real quick. And we have Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders at this time. And starting in verse 29, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we would have lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to Gehenna? Therefore I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify, others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth 
from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all of this will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. So Jesus is speaking to these religious leaders in Jerusalem, about Jerusalem, about them killing the prophets, them persecuting, them going to further persecute people that are being sent to them. So as they start to walk away, and uh, they're leaving the temple, you have to imagine, these apostles have no history. They know what had happened. That happened in Babylon when the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem. They know this. They have this in their mind. So Jesus is yelling the same judgment that they've known through their history. And he tells them, you know, they come to and they say, well, what about these buildings? These buildings are beautiful. They're pointing at the temple. And he says, do you not see all these things? Do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left upon another. <coughs> Everyone will be thrown down. And then he's sitting in that. This is the text that we're reading. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us. When will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Obviously, we've talked to Apostle Christ, spoke about the erroneous uh, oral translation in King James. The end of an age. And remember, we read Hebrews, Hebrews 8.13 about what was soon coming to an end. So, who killed the prophets? Jerusalem. Israel. These Pharisees. Upon that generation would come judgment. They would be judged for what they did. And... The first thing he does is he yells about this temple being destroyed. This is the first sign. You know, they're asking, when will this come? What will be the sign of this? What will this time be? When you see this temple, not one stone will be left upon another. And we know historically that in AD 70, that temple was destroyed by the Romans. So, his coming. The problem with this is we always look to this as a second coming. All it says is your coming. They're asking about his coming. If you study through the Old Testament, Genesis 11, 5, Exodus 3, 8, so on and so forth, it's all throughout the scriptures. Isaiah 19, 1 says, The Lord came into Egypt on a cloud. You don't believe that Jesus literally went to Egypt. We know that it was a coming. It was a judgment that referred to Egypt. They're asking him, when will this judgment happen? That's what he's asking them. That would symbolize the end of the age. So, in Matthew 24, I find it interesting that one of the number one signs he gives them is wars, rumors of wars. We hear that today. When's the last time you haven't heard of war? We've had war. But in Israel, in their context, they had the Pax Romana. There was the peace of Rome. There was no wars. In 50 AD, wars started. This was a symbolized that it's, the time is not yet, but the beginning of birth pains are happening. They knew that this was coming upon them. You see this judgment language when it talks about heaven, you know, the sky, the moon will turn black. You read this throughout the whole Old Testament of judgment that came upon cities. It was judgment language. They knew their city was about to be destroyed. That their covenant, like I said, Josephus, the historian, recognized that this was God leaving them. This was God judging them for what they did. Jesus just told them judgment will come upon them in that generation. And sure enough, in the end of Matthew 24, at the end of telling them all this stuff, he says, I'll read. Now learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And stop. Okay, pass the birds. You can begin now. Praise the Lord. Oh, there you go. Praise the Lord. 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 I want to say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You know, I love about what I love about Jesus the most is that you know he's a very sharp. He was a very sharp, and still is very sharp, by the way. That's why we have the mind of Christ. But uh, his disciples asked him a question, but Jesus didn't answer the question the way it was asked because they said this. They said, you know, Lord, you know, verse three. Tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. That word end there is the word in the Greek that means the consummation of all things. But interestingly, we know that Jesus listed things that our brother just mentioned about wars and rumors of wars and things. Verse 7 says, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in dire places. We're seeing it happen right now. There's been several earthquakes in the last number of weeks around the world. I mean, it's happening more and more and more. Haiti, Indonesia, hundreds of thousands of people being swept into eternity. Well, in verse number 14 of the same dissertation of Jesus, he says this, and he said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, 
and then shall the end come. That's a completely different Greek word. That word, there's the word telos in Greek, and it actually is the word that means the, not the end of everything, but it's talking about the end of something, meaning the end of an age. Now, going back to my position as a dispensational uh, uh, position, you know, we have the, you know, the theologians have broken down dispensations this way. There's at least seven of them, some say as many as 11. But innocence is the first dispensation. That was Adam and Eve before the fall. Conscience is after the fall of Adam and Eve, where they begin to live by a fall, and uh, they fell from grace, and they fell from God's uh, presence. Then we had the time of Noah, the dispensation of human government. This is where the Tower of Babel came out, things like that. Then we came into the time of promise, or so the time of Abraham, where God made promises to Abraham that, are, that we are living in the fulfillment of those promises. And then came the dispensation of grace, or the church age, which is what we're living in right now. Future to come is the, uh, the return of Christ. It's going to be the uh, seven-year tribulation is another dispensation. The millennial reign of Christ. The judgment seats, which there's two. One for the sinner and one for the saint. Can you say amen to that? So when you look at these things at the end of an age, Jesus is saying when this gospel of the kingdom has been preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then the end of the church age is going to stop and there's going to be another age that's going to kick in, glory to God which is the second coming of Christ uh, for the church. Praise God. Can you say amen to that? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the position that my brothers are taking over on, this side of the, on the other side of the table. And I respect them very highly for what they're sharing. Very intelligent, very articulate, very uh, interesting information they're sharing. But here's the thing about us, as, as uh, Mary Rose and myself, where we're standing on this, is it's important for us to understand that we're living in the last days, and that really is a tremendous motivation for us as the church to want to see people not miss heaven and go to hell. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, all right? And people need to hear the gospel. This gospel is a gospel of salvation. It's a gospel of healing. It's a gospel of power. It is a gospel of, of, of God's favor. It is a gospel of good things that God wants to do and has done in Christ for them. I tell people God's not mad at the world. Jesus has already reconciled the world to himself. They just don't know it yet. That's why we've got to tell them we've been committed or deposited in our hearts the word of reconciliation. And if they'll hear it, believe it, receive it, they can enter into this reconciliation with God. If they fail to hear it and fail to receive it, then it's over for them, basically. You know, um, so I'm, I'm concerned because if you say, well, we're not, we're not in the last days, if we're not... Uh, you know, these are not the end times. Well, there's no real urgency to reach people for Christ. It's not just people dying and entering eternity that way. There's the urgency of Christ were to come. I mean, people are, are going to hear the gospel and have heard the gospel. But I, I can tell you, I've been to 14 different nations. There may be some here at the table have been to many more than me. But I've been in remote, part, third world countries. I've been in parts of the world where there's all kinds of crazy, you know, uh, false religions. And these people don't even know Jesus. I have a friend of mine who's now a pastor in Uganda that I spoke for. Spoke to some 15, 20,000 people in his church. And this gentleman, uh, when he got saved, as he was born, he was born, his mother threw him in the garbage because he was only a couple of pounds. His grandmother, who was a witch doctor, picked him up and raised him, gave him a chance at life. And when one day somebody met him and asked him, do you know who Jesus is? He said, what's a Jesus? What's a Jesus? He didn't even know Jesus was the name of a person. This guy ended up getting saved and changing his nation to Uganda, but I'll pick up a time. Okay, Apostle Christ, you may begin now. Okay, I, I agree that there should be a sense of urgency to share the gospel. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation or deliverance. I totally agree. Where I differ is that I don't need a fear factor to give me motivation. I don't need a fear factor. What pushes me is the fact that I know that I'm not on a timetable in that aspect. That I have time to share the truth about Christ because God in Christ reconciled the world back into himself. I believe it 100%. I believe that Paul knew exactly what he was saying when he told Timothy that in reference to Jesus, that he was the savior of all men, especially them that believe. I believe that wholeheartedly. And because I believe that, I have an urgency to let all my lost sheep brethren know that the sheepfold is open and the master has reconciled you. So I don't need a factor of a last day factor. Um, I believe that when the scripture says, what are the signs of thy coming, based upon Matthew 24, 23, 
and of the end, Jesus did answer them. I believe that it would have been deceptive of Jesus to not answer their question, considering that he constantly answered their questions. Now, he didn't always give them the answer they wanted to hear, but he answered their questions. And I think that if we overlook that reality, we can misinterpret the scriptures for what they're saying. I believe that the coming of the Son of Man was judgment. Why do I believe that? I believe that because you see it in the Psalms in reference to coming to Egypt. You see Isaiah making that reference. You see these things and then such as the term that was used. Uh, Matthew uses the days of tribulation. Luke records it a little bit different. Days of vengeance. And so and when did those things happen? My brother mentioned about the wars. Those things begin to come. And historically it is proven that many of the Jews, when they finally went to one of their greatest rebellions, Rome said, we had enough, and sent in um, Tiberius and came in the general, they laid slaughter to them. And you know where many of their bodies ended up at? Gehenna. When Jesus warned them that this is a place that you can end up in, which is translated in the King James as hell, but it's Gehenna. They ended up there in a place that burnt up garbage and criminals. That's a historical fact. We cannot remove history in interpreting the scriptures because that takes away even from the validity of what Jesus said. Now, this is amazing. One of some of the greatest, greatest Christian writers, C.S. Lewis, a great Christian writer, had one thing in the, in the consummation of his life. He said Jesus was a great teacher, but he was false. Here's why he said he was false, because all the things that he said would come to pass, they never happened. Well, they did happen, but if I have Darby, Ryrie, Schofields, influence over society teaching me that something is going to come and it never shows up, I dismiss Jesus' words. No, I do not believe that every other religion is a way. I believe Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. But I can have understanding why other systems don't follow us because Jesus prophesied things that said were well, at hand. His apostles says were near. They were soon to come. And logic, whether we like it or not, logic is part of God. People don't believe that, but the word logos is God's logic, which manifested in Christ. Logic cannot say that near or at hand means a thousand years later. If I go to my brother here, Pastor Brooks, and I say, listen, I'm coming to you in a moment. And he's waiting for me a hundred years. I didn't come in a moment. Now, when Jesus was in the earth, he was speaking as a human being and he spoke to them in terms that they, they didn't understand. And so when we see, which I have a hundred, a hundred and one time scriptures here that deal with Jesus makes reference to this generation shall not pass until they see this happening. Uh, we see this generation, these things are fulfilled. He says, heaven and earth would pass away, which is another Jewish idiom. Heaven and earth culturally was understood that when you went to the temple was where heaven met earth. And when heaven and earth passed, there was a fulfillment. The reason there is a, such an importance on the destruction of the temple, why that's so critical, is because it was a symbol of the old covenant still being in place. And when we see in Hebrews, the eighth chapter, which Hebrews is the covenant to walk. It declares that it was obsolete and fading away. So there was one fading out and one coming in. It didn't take 2,000 years for that to happen. It took a moment when Jesus said it is finished. And stop. All right, well, can we give our contestants a round of applause? Okay, we are going to move into the next part of this um, round table. That is the cross-examination. And what this is, and I'm just going to lay out some guidelines and rules here just so we're all on the, on the same page. A cross-examination is going to start in the same order that we've been going in. And they're going to be able to ask each other questions. What I ask of the, of the panel is that you ask one question at a time. Uh, and then you let the person answering respond before asking the second question. So we don't have anybody jumping over each other with their words and all that stuff. Okay, um, there might, there's going to be five minutes again for each person. Uh, if you're done with your questions, you can say, you know, you're finished, and we'll move on to the next person. Uh, but again, um, uh, respectfully, just ask one question at a time. Don't ask like a, a part, a six-part question. You know, that's going to, you know, make you go all over the all over the Bible. Just ask one question at a time. Uh, let it give the person time to respond. And when you're answering the question, uh, don't like drag it out with with stuff that's irrelevant to the question. 
Okay? We good? All right. Okay, uh, Pastor McAvoy, you can start now. I am a little bit by fear, fear of the Lord. Just like we're the days of Noah, by faith, Noah being born of God, and things not seen, moved with fear, prepared and all, for the saving of his house. So, um, I'm not a fear monger. My fear is in reverence to the Lord, and I am to have uh, be children of the light, and to rightly divide the word, to uh, proclaim his righteousness to a, to a lost world. So, with you know, everything happening in the first century to Christians, I, I just wouldn't know what my purpose was. So I, I, I don't know uh, how to believe any other way than to world evangelization, reach, reach a world, reach a people who don't know Christ. So if there's nothing to save people from because it happened in AD 70, I, I just don't know I, I guess my question is, what is your what is your purpose if if everything is already passed? Oh, oh, my purpose is to bring the reality that it has been fulfilled. Why do I say that? Because it's a guarantee that what Jesus said is true. If His words were true and came to pass, then also His words are true when He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Romans lets me know that through kindness, some translations say, thy loving kindness, you have drawn to repentance. And so that's why fear is not my motivating factor. My motivating factor is when I was a young teenager and involved in craziness and I was being shot at. And when I turned 20, I had a contract out on my life and God intervened in jail to stop it. It let me know how much he loved me. That's been my motivation. I don't need to um, have a motivation to preach because... Why should people be saved? Here's why people should learn of their salvation. Because it's the restoration of their sonship. It is the restoration of their fellowship where they that have been joined unto the Lord have become one spirit. It now goes back to the original intention as what we were allowed to see in scripture was this fellowship, this harm interaction with God, with God the Father. And so that's my purpose is to let all my lost sheep brethren know your position has been restored. And how do I enter into that? Through repentance. What is repentance? Rethink your posture. Well, how can I rethink? Well, this is why I'm here. Because how can they be saved except there is a preacher? How can he preach except he's been sent? So my purpose is to wake people up to the reality that Jesus has done what he has said. Do you have any more questions, Pastor? Okay, next, uh, Pastor Miano, uh, your cross-examination can start now. All right, I, uh, I'll address both of you, just uh, be the person that wants to answer. I'm going to turn to Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, we have Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he says this. He says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come up after me, he must deny himself and take his cross follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So, my question is, did the people alive see him coming in his kingdom? Thanks for that question. You asked me such an easy question. Turn the page, my, my pastor brother, to chapter 17, and let's look at verse number 1, the very next verse to that, question, that statement of Jesus. Some of you standing here will not see death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom is Lord. Well, after six days, in verse 1, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment it was white as light, 
And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Duh. Uh, hello. If thou will, let us make your three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, I'm sure Jesus just asked what he wanted to do. He wanted to spend eternity in a tent on a mountain, you know. But this was what this was here. This was actually the fulfillment of what Jesus said there in Matthew 16 in that last verse there. They saw him when he was looking like in his glorified state. So this is a future glory that he gave them a glimpse of. This is a glimpse of that glory. And so uh, basically that's the answer. I want you to give anything to add to that. Dr. Story gave an explanation that yes, and it was fulfilled at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was uh, with, with the prophet um, and Moses, Moses and Elijah, and they were both or had already ascended to their glorified place, and there the apostles were able to visibly see him in his future glory. And they were, it was a taste, it was a taste, a glimpse, a glimpse of glory. So there you have the um, theological explanation for the biblical text in context. Another question, Mike? Yeah. So following that logic, he says, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here, some. This is six days later. I don't believe uh, any of the people had passed away or tasted death at that time. And the problem I have with this text, and I'm asking you to answer this, is he says that at that time he will reward each person according to what he has done. I don't see him giving rewards in, at the Transfiguration. Did he give rewards at the transfiguration? It's uh, Matthew 20, uh, 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, it's describing a future event. His message of his future kingdom was delivered to the apostles. So it was the same sense of that it describes a, a future event. But, but, but based, how could, on what, what could you base well, that? Hold on, hold on, let's say, you, you, you asked, um, you're the last one to ask. Okay. That's the next one. Go ahead. Pastor, do you want to add anything to that answer? Or? Yes, I would like to add, add something to that. I think that's a fair question that you're asking, Pastor Mike. I think that's a, a fair question because if you take, again, you know, the problem that the church has, in my opinion now, my humble opinion, is that, we're, and we're all guilty of it as preachers, I'm, I've been guilty of it as well, is that we like just to pull a verse out or a passage out, but not look at it in its entire context. This is where biblical interpretation is really, you know, been lost in the church world is we haven't taken it in its full context. First of all, we all know this, I wish we should know it, that the Bible wasn't written in chapters and verses, okay? I mean, these, these were one just, you know, this was a, a, a written by Matthew and, and Mark and Luke and John and all the writers of the epistles. You know, but they were, these, these were put in here by the King James translators. And so, it, it, well, the way they broke this up, they just said, let's end it here in verse 28, let's just start a new chapter and call it verse 1. And, you know, the answer was, but this is an ongoing and a continual thought. So you're saying it doesn't it doesn't happen right there in Matthew 17 in the first couple of verses there. I'm telling you, if you read the context of Scripture, you will see that it does happen ultimately. Because, you know, you're trying to make it fit, you know, your, your, your theology based on chapters and verses which weren't even part of the original text. Okay, uh, Pastor Burns, it is your time to, to ask any questions. Uh, and your cross exam can start now. Okay, does anybody here, you know the you know the winning numbers for the lottery that's coming? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a fair question, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly used the money right now. <laughs> you know, when I read uh, one of my, and I didn't get to this passage, but I want to get on and ask you to comment on it. If you have a question about it, I guess just to ask you your, your comment about what you say about it. When we talk about dispensations, I've already broken them into time periods. Shows you what's been taught a lot by theologians about dispensations, you know, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, you know, grace, you know, and the ultimate in time uh, dispensations that are going to come, we believe. When you read 
uh, the letter of the Hebrews in chapter 11, you know, it starts out that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it goes on talking about, you know, uh, you know Abel, it talks about, you know, Noah, it talks about, you know, uh, Enoch, it talks about, you know, uh, Abraham and Sarah, and all the patriarchs. And if you study them, and it, it does end, you know, at the end, it gives a whole listing of a bunch of more of them. You know, it doesn't really come into the New Testament in that chapter. Again, it's only a chapter in verses. It is one long, continuous letter. I noticed that faith in God has worked in every dispensation. Because Hebrews 11, in my opinion, is a breakdown of dispensations of time. Cain killing Abel, that was just after conscience into, into uh, I mean, it was after innocence into human, uh, into uh, human, uh, into conscience, where men were living by their consciences, which were corrupted and fallen. And then we see Noah, that's the time of human government. You know, and then we see the time you know, of Enoch, which is also in that same, you know, similar time uh, dispensation of that age. And as you go along in Hebrews 11, you find uh, that in every case it was by faith, or through faith, you know. And I'm just, I'm just saying to myself here, you know, it doesn't really matter to me what season we're in, what age we're in. Faith has worked. Faith in God has worked in every single one of them. And um, I'm curious, you know, in these last days that we're living in, and the threats in the economy, different things like that. What's your perspective on Hebrews 11 in respect to faith that we need to be having toward the Lord in these, what I read earlier from 2 Timothy 3, these difficult and dangerous times that are upon us right now? Okay? Um, as far as faith, I would say that I have the same faith you do. I, uh, I have the same faith of the saints that I'm living in the spiritual reality of what they hoped for, you know, which we see in Hebrews chapter 12, it speaks about approaching Mount Zion, this heavenly city. And I believe that I hold that faith. I hold the faith that is secure, that the promises of Israel to the fleshly Israel were fulfilled, and I'm living as a Christian in the fulfilled reality, as a Gentile Christian at that, in the fulfilled reality of what God promised the saints that you read about in Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that's, it's the same faith, I guess. I would say that my faith is based on the spiritual reality that I'm living in, the kingdom of God. I also believe in the, uh, the fact, I believe in the finished work of Christ, but I believe it is a finished work of Christ in respect to redemption. That, you know, he's already reconciled us to God, but we have to believe and receive that. By his stripes we were healed. You know, Christ hath redeemed us. We were blessed with all spiritual blessings. Who hath blessed us? Past tense. I believe in the past tense of God's word. In that, in that, in that connotation, but in that context, but I don't believe it as you have, you know, very uh, articulately described it in the sense of um, that it's all been completed. Israel's prophecies have all been fulfilled. Uh, I was curious. Um, are there any other passages that you have that you really believe that are uh, that really clearly state that? Because I, I think that what we've what we in our discussion here, we've, we've we've answered some of those things and said there's another side that there's another angle to look at that from. You know, when you like the, the scripture about you know coming in His kingdom and His kingdom has come. Well, that's obviously was 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 in my opinion a clear misinterpretation of that. And I think we've answered a couple of the other ones. So, uh, what other scriptures would you say you have that, that clearly to you cause you to take the position that you've taken? Well, okay. Apostle, you can, you can answer this question and then your question I can answer. Well, there are a number of times doesn't permit. I actually have 101, a little bit more that I had a chance to type out, which I could give you. Sure. But, I, but I want to back up to, to something um, and then I'll ask my question and I'll answer and try to move into. Um, when we were discussing earlier about the Son of Man, you know, and it is, it is coming. The reason that I believe my faith and your faith is the same is because it occurred. Why do I believe that? Because he spoke that in that context from Matthew 16. He's dealing with a particular group. But then he's speaking to Caiaphas. You see in Matthew 26. And he says to Caiaphas that you're going to see the Son of Man coming in power. Now, the transfiguration couldn't be a fulfillment of that. Because Caiaphas was not there in the Mount of Transfiguration. And so, I hold to context, and context, context is what caused me to have faith that I don't care how troublous the times are. 
My faith is strong because I believe the kingdom is now. Why do I believe that? I believe because when Paul, closing out based on, even you listen, that's why he's correct, the way it's based on Ephesians 3.20, he makes a reference to glory to Christ and to world, which is an age without end. Well, the only way we can kind of interpret that, what age would be without end? We'd have to look at Isaiah and make a reference to his, and his increase of his government, there shall be no end. So we understand government is kingdom. So Paul was making a reference, letting know that the kingdom was now. It was there. It was happening. It was age or world without end. That increases my faith knowing that our government supersedes this government. Do I agree with everything going on with our government? No, I don't, but I'm definitely, I'm USA, I'm American all the way. I just don't like what's going on in our government, but I'm part of a government that supersedes that government. So therefore, my faith is solid knowing that regardless of what happens, Sandy came and South Shore suffered tremendously, and I'm trying you know, to do whatever I can do but there were many believers in that that overcame that. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And so therefore, I don't care who's president, who's not in that context, what his position, her position, whatever it is, our government supersedes that. My faith doesn't move. I believe we have the same faith, definitely. Now, <laughs> I had a few things and I'm trying to... Can I, just, can I just address something you said there? Though? Yes, Pastor. You were making uh, a point earlier about... Um, about Caiaphas. Caiaphas did see Jesus coming. He wasn't there the transfiguration. He said some, speaking about those that were there at the time he made that statement. Caiaphas eventually saw the coming of Christ or the glory of Christ in that way when he was raised from the dead. Because he was part of that process of his trial and his ultimate crucifixion. So to say that that wasn't fulfilled, again, to me, is, a, is, a, is not, not accurate. Well, that's my, that, that's my point. My point Caiaphas was not in the Mount of Transfiguration, and if you say he saw his coming, then the scripture is fulfilled, he came. And then see, that's again, it's not a point of semantics, because we, we, we don't have time, but based upon the logic that I'm presenting, if that transfiguration was a, a uh, fulfillment of Matthew 27 and 28, excuse me, Matthew 26, 27, Matthew 16, 27, 28, those last two verses, then, how do we, we can't say it's a fulfillment if Caiaphas wasn't there, if Jesus uses almost the same terminology to Caiaphas himself. And, 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 and yes, yes, and I'm coming to it, I'm trying to rush. And if he did see that aspect of coming, then that means he did come. And if he came and Caiaphas saw it, then there's nothing else to come in that aspect. Well, that's not, no, that's again, that's, that's again, I, I, you, you miss, I think you're missing it in this area. He said, if you read the context of that, it's clear that Jesus said there are some standing here. You didn't see everybody standing here. Of, of, that, of was course, that, 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 was the, that was the fulfillment of that particular mention in Matthew 16, 28, and in chapter 17. With Caiaphas in verse 26, that's a whole other aspect. Jesus was able to make that same statement. It wasn't tied to what he said in 16, 28 directly like that. It was, it was a whole other scenario, a whole other situation, and he did see it when Christ was raised from the dead. You can't build a doctrine on one scripture. It seems like we're stuck on that one scripture. You have to take the totality of scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. You can't get stuck on 97 percent of the Bible is accurate. We have to deal with the three percent that we don't understand. And it seems like you're stuck on this one scripture. You have to take the totality of scripture, which interprets scripture. That's proper hermeneutics. Okay. Uh, possibly. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask my question. All right. You can start now. And, and, and I'm going to take, and again, I want to take a look at, uh, da, 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 da. let's see, let's see, I lost my place. Give me one moment. Okay, let's take a look at Mark 13.30. Mark 13.30. Let me get over here, give me a second. iPad. Thank you for being patient. All right. Now again, we're, the reason that we're in this particular area here is because this is the subject matter. Just the subject matter. Um, it's not about being tied to any scripture. It's the subject matter. 
As I said, because of my covenantal position, I'm very much strong on context. On context. That's why we're here. And so you notice here in Matthew 13, verse 30. And again, after the parable of the fig tree, in Matthew, you know, Mark's writing, he says, Verily I say to you that this generation, this generation shall not pass, to all these things shall be done. And again, this is another narrative of the same thing we're talking about, just this is coming through Mark. My question is, did that generation see those things? And if they did not, then how can the scripture be true? Within the context of the round table, this is what we're dealing with. So therefore, this is why I'm in this particular line of scripture. Versus, versus um, the admonishment of not being stuck on the scripture. No, this is the context that we're dealing in. And so therefore, I'm staying within that framework of context because my statement was because of my covenantal position, that's I view everything through context. So I'm definitely for in context, but okay. well, we're talking about the last days. Well, well, first, yes, first of all, the, the word generation here doesn't mean like a generation like you know my grandparents, my great grandparents, and great great grandparents, and I'm down here in the generational tree. This word generation here means age. Again, a reference to a dispensation. So it's not what you would read it as. These people here never did see this. So yeah. So. Uh, that to me is the first is my first response to that, and I think that's a pretty powerful uh, you know, re rebuttal on that. I have one for that too. But when you come down and you read, you know, the context of these things Jesus is talking about about wars coming, the great tribulation, uh, his second coming, he's coming again. Uh, and then he uses this parable here about the fig tree that he spoke of earlier. Um, I think that in the totality of the context here. This is again not a reference to just a group of people like it was in Matthew 16, 28, those people standing there. This is a statement he's making basically, not only to uh, the peoples of that time, but to the entire age that uh, was there. Because Christ, you know, Christ didn't live during the church age in his earthly ministry. He lived and ministered under the dispensation of the law. You know, the, the, the church age didn't begin until the day of Pentecost. Some say when Jesus rose from the dead, I, I can believe that too. Well, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. So Jesus ministered under the law. And so, you know, he was sharing things uh, about the future age coming. And so that's why uh, the generation didn't pass away until that new covenant came into being. And uh, that's why, that's my response. Okay. Uh, the cross examination time is complete. Uh, on that, uh, we give our, our panel a round of applause. Uh, if you have time to dance, we've got one more question, and then we're going to open up to the floor for you guys, if you guys have any questions towards any of our, our panel here. Um, so the last question that uh, Pastor McAvoy uh, will begin with is, what does this doctrine of the end times matter to a Christian's everyday life? What are the advantages? And disadvantages, and again, we have five minutes, and that begins now. Okay, we talked about the hour that we're, we're living in. I, you know, I, by the Spirit of God, I feel these perilous times are coming. I feel the, the, the return of the Lord is near, and uh, world evangelization. Quote uh, Matthew 24 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Need for world evangelization. Um, what said uh, Bible prophecy? What we were waiting on was the regathering. Remember, because of the destruction of the temple, uh, 
the Jews were scattered through, throughout the earth and they lost, they lost their land. But in 1948, uh, they reclaimed their land and it was, uh, they got their own nation. And that was May 15, 1948. So that set Bible prophecy in, in it, it just set it, set it in motion because many things could not begin to happen unless those prophecies were fulfilled. The, the unbelieving Jews would be regathered back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. They got their own nation. So this is what set us in the time that we're in now. So why, why is this important us to know the, the signs that we're living so we can prepare? After Matthew 24, the next chapter begins 25 with the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. And the wise, the five, um, ten virgins, five who were wise, five were foolish. The five who were described as wise gathered oil for their lamps because there will be a time when we cannot gather oil, the Holy Spirit, revelation, understanding. And the ones who were considered foolish did not take the time to prepare for their bridegroom. So we have to gather oil while there is time to gather oil for our lamps. So we understand that the kingdom was explained in parables, that there will be a, a separation between good and evil. And Revelation 25 and 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So God is going to have a set apart people, a holy people. The overcomers in Revelation, in, in the book of Revelation, are described as people who have overcome the sin nature, who don't have secret sin, people who are, who, who are going to be rewarded, who are going to rule and reign with Christ, who are going to partake of his coming literal thousand year reign. We have to be wise virgins and prepare for our bridegroom, prepare for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and where Christ will marry the church before his return. And then, you know, whether you believe in a seven year, literal seven year tribulation period, you know, that, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm not too bothered by that. My husband actually is mid-trip. And I'm not bothered by that. He wants to hang out with the Antichrist. That's fine for me. I'm, you know, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not stuck on any, any um, traditional beliefs, but this, this is what the fathers have taught us down. This is from the background I was taught. I, I have researched it. I have learned other views. I, ha I definitely have respect for your research, and I respect uh, your views. I, I, I take it into all totality. Well, that's how you arrive to that conclusion. I, I can understand you thinking that that meant that, but there, you know, there's an explanation, and, then, and there's logical, there's logical reasoning. You know, why, 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 it is a futuristic event. Because we still have death. We still, we're, we're, we're under the rule. We're in this age that's under evil, according to Galatians 1.4. It's ruled by Satan, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. The church has no power. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I was very discouraged. I, I was asked to pray for someone in hospice, and, and I, I was very sad, and that person died two weeks later. You know, I'm not saying that no one gets healed, but I don't really see the church. Um, in, in its full glorification and power, overcoming the powers of darkness in the present world, ruled, ruled uh, with, with wickedness, uh, obviously the spirit of error, the spirit of antichrist. So, so you know, just the age of come is something to look forward to. If this is all that, that this is the best you got, it's not that good. But so we, with the preaching of the gospel and with, with the, the final call of the souls that will come in in these last days, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking to Joel, and Joel, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I didn't need to start with Pastor. <laughs> okay, next, uh, Pastor Miano. Uh, what does the doctrine of the end times matter to Christians' everyday life? The advantages and the disadvantages. And you can start now. In Romans chapter 9, verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, For an unceasing anguish in my heart, for I, I wish I could myself be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel.
the divine glory, the covenant. There's the adoption of sons, there's the divine glory, divine glory and the covenant and receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, whom is God all over, forever praised. Amen. The problem is, is the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 24 and 26, he says that he has not spoken anything other than what the prophets and Moses had spoken. They were speaking about Israel. I know earlier we talked a little bit, or I know a the pastor here had mentioned replacement theology. I don't believe in replacement theology. I believe remnant theology. I believe that a remnant of national Israel became spiritual Israel as the Gentiles were grafted into spiritual Israel, neither Greek nor Jew. So my thing is, the reason why I find this has to be fulfilled is because if the Apostle Paul did not speak anything other than what the Old Testament prophets had spoken, and we find that these were the promises of Israel, of national Israel, then therefore I have to come to the conclusion that these were fulfilled in order for this, in order for this spiritual reality to have come to us today. As you know, I take this pretty serious. Um, in Romans chapter 10, the next verse, we read about how the Jews killed Jesus because they had a zeal for God, but they did not have the knowledge of God. To me, that is good demonstration that a zeal for God without knowledge is pretty dangerous. And many Christians today are characterized by a zeal without knowledge. They have this zeal for God, but they have not a knowledge of God. This allows false paradigms and false teachings to continue to snowball effect and to be based on tradition and to get bigger and bigger. As I would say that the futuristic teaching of a second coming of Christ is a snowball effect of false view. You know, it's been told to us today that we should look at the times and how bad the times are. We are in these, you know, last days. But the biggest thing I would say, my contention is consider yesterday. Go back and read some texts from that time. Read the works of Josephus. Read the works of Tatticus and see that they experienced these times. You, know, you had cannibals in the first century that were eating their children because of the times they were in. So why we're here is because we all believe that this needs to be reconciled, this difference, this understanding of whether or not we are in the end times or we're not, and all the stuff in between there. You know, I detest a lack of biblical clarity. I think that we need to have clarity, we need to have counsels, we need to be doing things like this, that we can get to a better understanding because we are the body of Christ, we are the healing of the nations. And, you know, I think it's so important to understand the redemptive events that happened in AD 70. You know, when I talk to people today, I evangelize with this view, and I talk to people and they know nothing about the history of Christianity, nothing about the first century, nothing about the teachings of Jesus Christ. They know a lot more about what the newspaper tells. We are led by a newspaper exegesis. I got this, uh, you know, the preppers are getting ready. This guy reads the book of Revelation every day. Now, I see the book of Revelation clearly talking about those who the, pro the prophets were murdered by. We just read Matthew 23, Jerusalem. So, this is an issue, and this has led to subjective teachings. I have people tell me all the time that they that might work for me, but it doesn't work for them. Like, well, we're reading one book. We don't have room for that. There's no personal interpretation, private interpretations going on in the body of Christ. And then there's the lack of care. You have pan-tribulationists, you know, pan-millennialists that all pan out in the end. I mean, have you decided which teachings of Jesus are more important? To me, they're all important. And I don't think that we give any glory to God by saying, oh, this is less important than the other stuff. We take all of Jesus' teachings as important. So this, like I said, this is something that needs to be answered. I read recently a quote that said, The real reason that influence of secular unbelief is so great in our day lies in the widespread failure of Christians to understand the Bible in its own context and present real Christianity to the world. Would the Bible have so much prophecy if it wasn't meant for us to understand it? You know, I take this serious because I consider myself a reformer. I consider myself on the edge of something that God is doing in our time. I can't provide you Bible scriptures to prove that. But I make no bones about the fact that I am right and futurism is wrong. If I am false, I am a heretic. My views are outside the body of Christ and they need to be reconciled. The defense of the faith is nothing that we can take lightly and we need to be understanding the scriptures in context. Okay, Mike, Pastor Burns. Um, you, you can begin now. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for sharing. And Mary Rose and uh, for Bishop. It's a real joy to sit here at this table and a privilege, you know, um, to be asked to be here. I, uh, I'm going to be very honest with you all if I can. I mean, not that I ever 
live from the pulpit. But, uh, I, um, when I was asked to do this, I jumped. I just said yes without really thinking about it or even really praying about it, to be honest with you. I had been praying for God to give me opportunities outside my church, and I just said, oh, good, an opportunity, amen, I'll do it. And after I did it, I got the questions from, Pat, from Apostle Johnny, and I was like, what the world did I get myself into? <laughs> and then I thought about it. I said to my wife, I'll be very candid with you. I said, you know, honey, I said, I can think of a lot more important subjects to speak about in eschatology right now, especially with what's going on in the world, what's happened recently with the hurricanes and the Nor'easter, the devastation that people are suffering with, how we can help and, and what we need to know about having faith for the last days. I mean, faith, as I said, transcends all ages and dispensations and it works in every single one. But uh, the Bible tells us, I don't know if you're familiar with this in the book of Revelation, that those who read this book there's a blessing on those who read it. And I've often said that where the Bible speaks, we should speak. And where the Bible is silent, we should be silent. I believe that wholeheartedly. And so it's important that we do talk about these things. So it is, it is an important subject. I've never in my ministry, and I've been in the ministry for 30 years now preaching, I've never really done a whole lot of teaching and preaching on end time events. It hasn't been a real interest. You know I mean? I'm interested, but... You know, I, I believe that God has specialists in the body of Christ. You know, it's interesting, Paul, who was of the stocking tribe of Benjamin, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, God didn't use him to reach the Jews. God sent him to the Gentiles. And Peter, a found mouth fisherman, God sent him to the Jews. <laughs> this is God fun. I would like to take those that you think would be more qualified and send them to the people he's least qualified to reach. You know, and so, you know, God has a sense of humor. Um, for me, uh, John, in the book of Revelation, uses uh, this thing called the seven seals. And you couldn't go from, uh, just jump into the seal and say, let's open up seal number five. Let's open up seal number two or three. You had to go seal by seal. The first seal, and when you open that seal up and it was completed, then would open the second seal. And then when that was completed, you could go to the third. And, the, and then when that was completed, to the fourth. And it's interesting that God does things according to patterns. And everything God does, He does according to a pattern based on the principle of His kingdom. And whether it's dealing with uh, faith or prayer, the Holy Spirit, evangelism, you know, prosperity, or about eschatology, God is very systematic about what He does. Someone said earlier that He used the term progressive. You know, I believe that the letter kills, as Paul said, but the Spirit gives life. And so when the Holy Spirit is breathing on something, my, my question becomes this. What you've heard here today... How is this going to move you? Are you just, you know, by, Paul said knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. Is this going to motivate you to go out there and lead someone to Christ today, what you heard here? Is it just going to raise more questions that you can say, well, now I'm really confused about the Bible and discourage you in your experience with Christ? You know, anything that I teach or preach, I want to see that it's building people up, edifying people in their walk with God. And I think that, you know, if that's the outcome of this event, I say hallelujah. But if it's not, I say maybe we need to say, Lord, help us to focus on what needs to be focused on. Because the end times are important. There is an end coming to this age. And there's more things after this age. Whether we'll live to see the end of this age or not, I, I believe I will as long as I live long and strong, which I expect to do. But if, there, if I don't, then uh, others are going to be living in this age and the end of it and the next coming age as well. So uh, I'm concerned also because there's a couple of scriptures I was thinking about. And one is uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul talked about um, verse 4. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you have received another spirit which you have not, which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with them. And then in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, he said, I marvel that you were so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And there's one more verse the Bible talks about being removed so soon from the simplicity that's in Christ. When things get complicated, they don't help people. Let's keep it simple. Saints. A-I-S-S. -S. Okay. Uh, Apostle Christ, you can begin now. Um, I uh, want to say, even as in my opening, you know, I, I just I honor everyone that that is sitting here and we're here. 
And um, as, a, as a lover of truth, which is love and truth is synonymous, really are. As a lover of truth, I'm driven with a passion to express the truth. Now, I'm not dogmatic, because it, because in all honesty, it doesn't make me like an individual that agree with me or not. I love them, it's my family, it doesn't matter to me. But, the reason this is so complicated, and it's so important, is because it is intertwined with so many false truths. And we have taken now, again, this might be offensive to some, we have taken the interpretation of who we were told were the church fathers. Because first of all, who, who, who determined that Clement, Arian, Tertullian were church fathers? That's a Roman Catholic history. That's another thing. And we have taken their words as being solidified Orthodox Christianity. Every, now, here's what's amazing. If you ever do a study on many of what's the church fathers, they didn't agree with each other. They did not agree with each other. And that's known, documented facts. And so we are basing something off of things that men argued about and never resolved. Which is why I believe there's still so much disunity amongst those that name Jesus as Lord. Because in our foundation of Christianity, not the kingdom truth, because Jesus didn't come to start Christianity, which is another issue. In our foundation of Christianity is disputed conflict. I believe that the Spirit of God is the spirit of truth. And so these issues will come up until there is better resolution. Now, I believe strongly in what I believe, but I also have enough sense to know at 47 years that I'm gonna to have to make some adjustments when I say, hey, and this is what this helps me to make adjustments. But these issues are important because this eschatology in times is also tied. Every place that you look at in the scripture, given what in and last, especially the gospels, I should say, is tied to the coming of the kingdom. Now, Paul says that the kingdom of God came in power. I heard my sister, as I heard her speaking, and yes, it's, I, don't, I don't like it when everybody doesn't get to hear what I pray. But I sure jump all over the place when those that were given terminal sentences 10 years ago are still here. I love that. And I don't look at it as not having power, but I've come to understand that if my thinking is convoluted, there are inhibitors that interfere with my faith. Now, I don't know, maybe everybody, every time they've laid hands on somebody, you just was 100% sure. I have not always been, and I'm just going to be honest. And God did it anyhow. And I said, I sure wouldn't have nothing to do with me because that was all you because I didn't think this one was coming out. Versus so, so I think these issues are important because I think the reality of the kingdom now, not a kingdom to come, but that the kingdom now, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, which is spiritual dimensions, is with us now. And I believe there's a deeper place of living out of that reality that's a stronger demonstration. I also believe in the appearance Notice my words, of Christ. You know, there's an issue about second coming, first coming. They said the second coming is split in two pieces. Well, that would mean it would be three, it wouldn't be two, which is another issue. The logic is not logical. Christ is in us and constantly appearing. The issue is, I believe that as we come more to the knowledge of truth, we're more susceptible, we yield more. Because Thessalonians says, when he appears in his people, he shall be marveled. And I believe he's in us, but there's an unveiling that has to happen. So the individuals can marvel at us. And I think that is love. That's what I believe. I believe the unveiling of Christ is our love walk. And it makes people marvel. And so we cannot move into that place if we don't deal with these discrepancies of our quote-unquote theology, which is amazing, the study of God. How do you study one that has no boundaries? And so we have to deal with these issues. I believe it affects our faith, as I said earlier, because I believe that Jesus' words are so, it's what makes me continue in spite of the things that I see, in spite of the discouragement that comes. Why? Because I know the kingdom is in why? Because he came the way he said he would come, and he came in me. All right, can we give our panel a round of applause? <laughs> so, and uh, we're going to close this out with any questions from the audience. I'm going to jack Johnson me on this microphone and give you. Thanks. Thanks. Lots on top of things here. Okay, does anybody here have any questions for any of the panel? You can raise your hands. And, okay, that's the bill right in front. Uh, this has been tremendous. And 
want to say, um, I couldn't disagree more on the major thing that you guys were saying, but you present your points beautifully. And there's clearly just a, a love for God in your guys' hearts. And I just want to tell you, I, I, I thoroughly respect you and your opinion. And I'll fellowship with you anytime. But I want to, I, I, I want to ask this because I, I get very excited about future events and I read a lot of them in the scriptures. My question to you is this. It's a two-part question, but it has to be two-part and it's not a long answer. It's going to be yes or no. So it's not going to take long, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this. I know a little something about the Bible. I don't believe I have as much knowledge as all of you guys have by far. But I want to ask you this. If the um, prayer is view is another... Uh, I don't know if it's a translation or just another view, which is probably one of the same, the amillennial view, which means that we are in the kingdom now. Is that kind of like what you're presenting, like the kingdom now, meaning that at the cross, Satan was bound? Is this, is, okay, I'm asking you, do you believe that at the cross, Satan was bound? Um, and according to Revelation, He's going to be put in the abyss for a thousand years, and then the millennial rain comes, which kind of advocates uh, Pastor Burns' uh, dispensationalism, which, which I believe. So my question to you is this. Was Satan bound at the cross? Is this the thousand year period that he's bound in, in order for us to, in order for the kingdom to be here now? Where is Satan during this time? Because the Bible says he will be loose after a thousand years, then come back to, see, to deceive the nations for a short period of time, probably about seven years. So my question to you is this, was he bound at the cross totally, and where is he now, according to your theology? Okay, well, first I'll make clear, number one, I'm not a preterist. That's the thing, I'm not a preterist because I do not believe in the ending of gifts of the Holy Spirit and manifestation gifts. I'm not a preterist. I believe that their view is a closer to a more accurate view. I am a covenantal theologist. I believe in the covenant, which can be termed as covenant eschatology. So I'm not a preterist. And I believe also that scripture is being fulfilled. Preterists believe that it's fulfilled is just done. Which is why, again, if anyone is, don't get offended, preterists I don't see doing a lot of evangelism. That's another story. I believe in the fulfillment of scripture, but they have a perpetual relevance, uh, relevance to us and they are perpetual progressive unfolding. Why? Because the scripture that is the word of God is eternal. So I believe there's a continued unfolding that moves throughout times. And I'll be dead and gone and with, the, with the Lord and it'll continue to be an unfolding. But that does not take away from the literal fulfillment. Now it's the issue of Satan. The issue of Satan. I know what preterists teach, but I'm not necessarily in agreement with them. Um, I believe that the beginning of the binding of Satan was when Jesus' ministry began. When it began. I believe the fulfillment of his demise was at the consummation of the end of the old covenant age in his wine. In Hebrews 2 and 14, in the latter part of it, in reference to Jesus, it says how reference Jesus destroyed him who had power over death, that is, the devil. Now that word destroyed does not mean annihilation, but it means to be rendered idle. It means to be rendered idle or useless. In other words, almost like when you burn a chair, it's a heap of ash. Now, people have different arguments over the lake of fire, but every place you see fire in the scripture is a reference to a form of judgment. And I don't want to get into that because people get upset when I say, you know, I don't believe we're talking about a literal lake of fire. I believe it's metaphoric language because the book of Revelation speaks of metaphor, symbolic, and, and apocalyptic languages. And so Satan is idle, rendered idle and useless and helpless. People say, well, how can that be? Look at all the evil in the world. Jesus told us where evil came from. He said it comes out of the heart of men. We blame the devil who Jesus destroyed and made an open show for things that are in people's hearts. This is why we preach the gospel, because it's the issue of the heart. And so, and people say, well, what do you mean? There's no more devil? I said, he's rendered useless, idle, or Hebrews 2 and 4 is a lie. Or 1 John is a lie. For this cause would the Son of Man manifest to destroy the works of the wicked one. You know, and how he made open show of principality and power. Either that's true or it's not. And so Satan for me is not a big issue. He's been rendered idle. He's not a big issue. 
People say, what about demons? And that's a whole other subject. When you, if you deal with one for real, what's the big deal? Just cast it out, keep moving. Most of the stuff over the deal is not demons, it's people need mental adjustments. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I want to thank everyone for um, who's on the panel. Thank you for being here. Super excited to be here in, um, uh, in this discussion with you guys. My question is for um, you two. Um, you said, uh, it might be a double question, I'm not sure. Um, you said that there was a sense of urgency to preach the gospel to every nation before the end times, the end of the world, and the second coming. If that is the case, what happens when that second coming comes and the world does end and we didn't reach everybody? What happened to those people that were never reached? What happened to those people who are living in wherever they're living and we just don't even know that they're there? What happens to them if we don't get to them? They're lost. They're lost where? They're, they will go to the second resurrection. The, the dead in Christ rise first, and that's the first resurrection. Those are who are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Those who are lost, the dead, the dead unjust, they're called. They don't come. They don't get resurrected for the white throne judgment, according to premillennialism. Till after the thousand year reign, the uh, the dead unjust uh, Christ will, will will go before the white throne judgment, and uh, they have not received. And their sins are not forgiven, and they uh, spend eternity in hell. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Miss. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm about I'm about lunch. I'm about to lunch. I'm about to lunch. I'm about to Thanks for that question. It's a great question. You know, and there's a lot of concern about that. People have asked, how can I have loving, merciful, and just God? Uh, send people to a godless hell, or really, eternity's not in hell, eternity's in the lake of fire. That wasn't even prepared for man, it was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what it initially was designed for. But this is why the devil is such a bad devil, because he's trying to deceive people. The urgency I was talking about, and I know I was, uh, my statement, maybe I wasn't as clear. You know, sometimes the message you send isn't always the message that's received. So you like to get the opportunity to kind of rectify it or correct it. But um, I wasn't talking about fear. Like, I'm motivated by fear. But Jesus did say, don't fear him that can destroy the, destroy the body. He said, fear him that can destroy both the body and the eternal soul. And there has to be that realization right now. I'm not a big hellfire and brimstone because I don't think that's the message Jesus preached. Jesus preached the message of grace and that, that he had come to redeem mankind. The goal is, for, uh, the Bible says, rain, the rain sh shines on the good, the evil, and the... You know, uh, I mean, rain falls on the good and evil, the sun shines on the just and the unjust. But there's also this other aspect of this here when it comes to, you say, people that haven't heard. You know, I don't know that everybody hasn't heard. But even if they haven't, the Bible tells us that the plan of salvation is seen. The heavens declare the glory of God. And it tells us that, yeah, it, it tells us, you know, why don't you quote that? Read that, Romans 1. But it tells us that, you know, uh, God has put the message of His existence around us in creation. There's people that are revolutionists, people that say, well, I just evolved and all that. I mean, they're just dishonest people. They're dishonest with themselves. They, they look, you cannot look around and see a perfect earth that rotates on a 23 degree axis. And if we were just one degree closer to the sun, we'd burn up. And if we were one degree closer away from this, further away, we would go into an ice age. I mean, it is just a, a, a very, it's not, it's not even just intelligent design which God is intelligent and He designed it's more than that. This is a creation. And it was a God who did it. So the heavens declare. So there is a yearning in the hearts of everybody. That's why people turn to false religions. That's why they worship rocks and trees and dirt and every other thing. Because something's in them telling them that there is a God. And if they're a true seeker of God like a Cornelius was, God had to send Peter from a, on a rooftop because he couldn't go in the house with Simon the Tanner and there were unclean animals in there. And God used that in his thinking to say, listen, I'm going to send you now, not just to the Jew, but I'm going to send you to the Gentiles in Cornelius' house. God will send people. That's why some of us, we have a sense of God's call in our life. If you don't obey that call, people aren't going to hear. Ezekiel said that if you see a man in the sin and you don't warn him of it, then God said when he dies, his blood will be on your hands. But if you warn him and he dies rejecting, then you're free from his blood. So we have a commission, a great commission. And uh, so oh, we also have the power of the Spirit. God, you know, I've heard stories recently in the Middle East 
of uh, imams and different ones that are in high positions of, of Islam that are actually having visitations from the Lord Jesus. He's appearing to them and telling them that he is the, the way, the truth, and the life. And I know that he gave us the mission to preach the gospel. If those things are true, I mean, God is intent on seeing people not lost. But I do believe that there will be some. I, I don't know who they are. I'm not the judge. Okay, we got a question right over here. Thank you very much for your, your time. Uh, I think you were I'm sorry. Uh, just a quick question. Thank you for being here. I appreciate uh, the offering and listening to what I My question is for Pastor Burns and Pastor uh, McAvoy. Um, you said in your opening remarks that there is a future redemption that will, that's completed upon the return of Christ. I read in John chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Then Jesus continues saying later on in chapter 14, talking to his disciples and saying that, um, that he was leaving. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there, may, uh, there you may be also. My question is, has heaven been opened up? If we don't have the fullness, fullness of redemption yet, how could anyone enter into heaven? Okay. Well, fullness of redemption are bodies. We've been resurrected in our spirit, so we may lie, we're in creation, Christ, that's by the spirit, right? Our soul has been uh, redeemed, and now we have the seal of the Holy Spirit, but it says that just we have the earnest seal for future redemption in Ephesians, and then uh, our bodily resurrection, we're all going to joy, and our bodies, bodies will go in the grave. At the coming of Christ, the dead in Christ will rise first and get their translated uh, heavenly he heavenly clothing, which is your glorified body. And then those which are alive and remain will be brought up together and they'll be living, living. They will not taste death. They will be translated what's known as the rapture. And all the scriptures that describe believers brought up to heavens or uh, Zechariah 14, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Revelation 21. But the second coming is a, is the saints re, the saints returning with Christ or were coming down, and that's when Jesus, for, and the Zechariah Messianic prophecy of his foot splits the Mount of Olives, and he is coming to judge wicked the uh, earth with his believers. Yes, I believe the same thing. That in the future, we are redeemed now. My spirit is doing the new creation of Christ. I'm the righteousness of God in Him. My spirit is that when my mind is being renewed to the Word of God, my soul's not yet saved. My soul. See, people mis mis uh, misunderstand the soul and the spirit. The soul and the spirit are not the same thing. The soul comprises the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotions, the memory, the imagination. The spirit is separate from that. That's why First Thessalonians 5:23, Paul prayed. Our whole spirit, soul, and body would be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord. So my spirit is alive unto God. My soul is being saved, and one day my body will be saved. That mortal prone immortality, the corruptible prone in corruption. Even the Bible says there's also a future redemption for the earth. God's not sending earthquakes. He's not sending tornadoes and hurricanes and nor'easters and tsunamis and stuff. This is the earth is groaning and travailing. The earth fell. When Adam fell in the garden, the earth also fell. And that's why the earth has not been working as perfectly as it did during that dispensation of innocence. And so that's why there's a redemption also not only for our physical bodies, but there's going to be one for the earth as well. What was it? You can look it up there. Is that a change? Well, I was just curious. What, what's in heaven now? What do you mean? What's in heaven? If we were all to pass away right now. Yeah. The intermediate state of the, the I, I dead was just to die? Is soul sleep? No, 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 no. I don't believe to be absent saying. from the body, Paul says, to be present, present with the Lord. That's intermediate. Well, no, you're, well, you're, you're, you're not your body. My body, the Bible says the body is going to return to dust, but God's going to give us a new body, a glorified body, a, a celestial body. There's a terrestrial body and right. there's a celestial, celestial body. And we're going to have a new body. This body is not going to be the body I'm in. God's going to change it, the incorruptible part of the corruption, the mortal part of the mortality. We shall be changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye. So when I, 
when I leave the church, should Jesus come and we get called away? The word rapture is not in the Bible, but I do believe in the concept of a rapture. Uh, but uh, my spirit will immediately go into the presence of the Lord. My body will return to dust. Uh, and then God will either call that back. I'm, I'm getting a little, confused, a little confused here. My body, if the rapture comes, I will go up with him in that moment. And in the process of going up, I believe I'll be transformed. My body will be transformed. If I were to die and be buried, and if he were to come, say, in 50 years, my body would have decayed and whatever it turned into, God would call those particles together in a, and then transform them instantly and be a new body. But my spirit would be in heaven. It's not soul sleep at all. That's, that's a Jehovah's Witness doctrine, and that is um, not scriptural. Okay, we got a we got a question at the back. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, panel for being here. Um, uh, where is the verse? Where is the verse? And what does it mean when it says? Um, uh, um, oh man! Oh I can't believe that. <laughs> Who's, who's your question towards the uh, pastor? Uh, no, it's basically to anyone who wants to answer. To anybody? Answer. Okay. Anyone who wants to answer it. Um, that we look through a glass darkly until that which is perfect has come. I feel that if that which is perfect has come already, then we wouldn't be struggling with what we're struggling with now. We wouldn't have this panel. There wouldn't be any need for a panel like this of, of diverse discussion. Um, I think that when that verse means that when the Lord appears again, then that, that that everything would be known. Like when you go to heaven, I don't think you have any questions. I think everything is known. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. You guys want to ask me out of our... Well, let's look at the context. Oh, no. Yes. Yeah, all right, brother, let me just say that scripture you're referring to is in First Corinthians chapter 13, all right? And um, when Paul talked about looking through a glass darkly, I mean, listen, we're looking through, you know, our, our spirit is complete. We're complete in him and our spirit. But my soul and my body are not yet uh, fully yet redeemed, even though there's a redemption from sickness and disease and the, power, the curse of poverty and things like that. You have to live, you have to appropriate those, kind, those, those particular promises. But uh, looking through a glass darkly and dimly means that we, we, we know in part, Paul said, we see in part, we know in part, we prophesy in part. What is revealed to us? The Bible says how unsearchable are the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. God's wisdom is unsearchable. So we're not gonna, we don't have that, we don't have that brilliant mind that, uh, or a clarity uh, in, our, in ourselves that Adam had in the garden. You have to understand when Adam fell, there was many things that fell. Not only did the spirit fall from God, but his body fell, and that's why he had to die. We were supposed to live forever in these bodies. Our mind, the mind, the intellect of, of, of Adam was phenomenal. How could he name all the animals that God worked to him and he gave a name to all of them? Because Adam's mind was incredible. And, and so when we when he fell, the earth fell, we fell, our spirit, our soul, our body fell. And even our spirit is restored to God and reconciled and born again and brand new and all that. Are, are we seeing still dimly and darkly because we're looking through the the, the glass of our of our understanding and our human experience, and so that's why what we see in the Bible says we're going to know even as even as we were known, and there's going to be things that are going to just the light's going to come on when we get into into heaven. That's, that's my simple answer. I don't know if that helps you. Oh, oh and, and I wholeheartedly agree. You know, with Fast and Mike, and there is also a figurative and a spiritual application. To that when you look at the context of this and what he's talking about yeah. and love and so forth yeah. and so on and seeing through but there's a that which is perfect has come not that which is faultless but that which is mature that which has gone through a perfected process i know that i am saved and i'm being saved and shall ultimately be saved that is i believe in three four chords anyway and so there's a process in my maturity as i mature by process by perfecting because even the scripture says, you know, that Jesus you was know, perfecting through the things he suffered. All right. And so as I go through the process, that which was dark is not dark any longer. Because when I was a child, I spoke as a child, but no longer a child in the context of that. And so we are progressively going through perfection. I believe I don't I believe that he has been doing a good work is faithful and good to the end. And so he's processing that many times without our cooperation. Which don't get upset with me. That deals with God's sovereignty. 
And if people say the Lord is a gentleman, He is, but not always. I'm sorry. He does some things without asking you to work with Him. He perfects us because he, it's His Spirit that's in us the will to do His good pleasure. And so and as we perfect, we begin to see Him more as He is because the reality is according you know, to Romans 8.13, we're joined as of God and joined as with Christ. Then according to 1 Corinthians 6, 17, they that have been joined to the Lord have become one spirit. So as I see him, I really begin to discover who am I. Because who am I, I'm who I am because of him and then I live, move, and have my being. And so I believe that there is a spiritual application to these scriptures as well. As we are perfected and as we mature, our vision we see better, our minds in this process of renewal. And once we see him, we saw all. There's nothing else to be found in Him. But the interesting thing, to see Him takes forever. So I believe it's a process. I just wanted to follow up. Um, you know, as a full preterist, one of my positions is I believe in a corporate resurrection. I believe that at the coming of the Lord, that the body, the body of Israel that was under sin, was raised to its, you know, its eternal state, its immortal state. It's a, it's a covenant resurrection, us in the body of Christ. So, when I read a text that talks about when the perfect comes, you know, and, and it's talking about seeing in a, you know, a glass dimly, I think of text, other resurrection texts, such as uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where it starts to talk about a veil that was over their eyes. There was a veil, there was a, you know, a thing of death that was over Israel that kept them in bondage, and it was the law, the law of sin and death. So, you know, in... 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we see the same thing. It says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away, but their minds were made dull. And to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It, is not, it has not been removed because only in Christ it is taken away. And then when you go to texts such as uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, it says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us and we should be called children of God. And this is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what will be has not yet been made known. But what we know when He appears, we shall be like Him. And we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. And you notice in the end of Revelation, when everything is complete in this kingdom of God, you notice that we see His face. That's what the preterist position is. I believe that I spiritually see Christ's face, that this was what they were waiting for. This is the time of the transition throughout the whole New Testament. This is why I said in my speech that, you know, understanding the transition that was going on from Old Covenant Israel to the New Covenant in Christ. So that's where I would say when the perfect king was the spiritual resurrection of the saints. Okay, everybody, can we give our, our panel a round of applause for the Thank you so much for coming down to being a part of Pest McElroy. Thank you so much. Uh, to me, this is, um, again, this topic and many other topics are so important because, you know, we need to have that Berean spirit. In the book of Acts, it talks about being noble-minded men. Those noble-minded men were, were honored because they were able to, to not only just believe what Paul was saying, but take what Paul was saying and then make sure it was in the Word of God. And, you know, honestly, I don't know if you guys come into the same problems that I do, you know, a, a, one of the big problems where people don't want to become a Christian because they think we're all hypocrites and they think we'll all fight each other. And, you know, there's so many different things. And listen, we're never all going to agree on everything. But you know what? Just to show that people with differences can disagree in a setting of respect, maturity, and love and lay out the, the, the scriptures as they see them for people now to then go home and study. If anything came from this, you go home and study your Bible more, that's a win in my book. Okay, that's a win in my book. So, uh, again, I, I can't thank these guys enough. I'm going to bring Bobby up forward in. Um, he's going to be, uh, yeah, real great. Uh, Bobby's going to be ordained the pastor of Sound of Heaven tomorrow. Yeah. Jason Bax will be ordained as the evangelist of Sound of Heaven. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just going to be it's great. So it's 1 o'clock now. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take an offering. I'm going to give the, the, the microphone over to Bobby uh, to take the offering. But I want to invite all of you back tonight at 7 o'clock. We have uh, Rob Wood uh, going to be here tonight. And we're going to be talking about defying religious Christianity. And what I pray and I hope and that Rob's prepared this message is to push you out of the box. 
and to doing things that, that God has called you to do, but gets you a little uncomfortable uh, in doing that. So uh, Rob's been awesome. He's been here before, and he was such a blessing to our congregation on a Sunday morning. So tonight at 7 o'clock, he will be here uh, uh, preaching. So you can come.